If you look at families where there is a lack of discipline, there's, there are not consequences for doing wrong, you tend to have a lot of yelling in those families, a lot of friction between the parents and the children because the children aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that just kind of goes on and on. Whereas I think when parents are wise in how they discipline and there are um, swift and fair consequences when children disobey, it helps with that reconciliation process. Both the parent and the child understands this um, wrong has been dealt with. You know, this, this child has been given consequences and now we can move on. Rather than, I just wanna punish the child by being angry with them for a while and maybe, I'll, maybe mom will forget about it and then things will go back to normal. Welcome to the Crossway Podcast a show where we sit down with authors each week for thoughtful interviews about the Bible, theology, church history, and the Christian life. I'm Matt Tully, and today I'm talking with Betsy Childs Howard. Betsy is an author and currently serves as an editor for the Gospel Coalition. Her newest book is one written for kids called Arlo and the Great Big Cover-Up from Crossway. Today, Betsy and I discuss stories and the importance of moral formation for children. We talk about why stories are such a powerful tool for instilling deep biblical truths in our kids, how the world catechizes our children every day, even in ways that might surprise us, and why intentional moral formation and an emphasis on the gospel of God's grace are not mutually exclusive. Let's get started. Betsy, thank you so much for joining me on the Crossway podcast today. It's great to be here, Matt. Thank you. So uh, when I brought home this new book that you've written, it's called Arlo and the Great Big Cover-Up. I got to bring home an early copy of the book uh, to my kids. I have three kids, three young kids, and we sat down on the couch after work, and I pulled it out of my bag, and I opened it up and read it to them. And I have to say, as soon as I finished reading it, the first uh, response from all three of the kids was, again. And then I read it again to them. (laughs) And they said again, and I read it again, and they, they literally asked me to read it three times in a row, uh, even the even the one year old, and that's that's kind of continued. It's interesting um, to see the staying power of the book uh, that it's had with them and and their interest in it. So I wonder if you could, before we jump in here, if you could just summarize the story for us, kind of what is the book about, what happens, um, and then we can kind of go from there. I'm so glad to hear that your kids like it. So the book is about a little boy named Arlo, and he is in the middle of a quiet rest time on his bed. And he uh, does something that many children do at some point in their life, which is draw on the wall. And then he regrets it and um, does what is a natural impulse, which is he wants to cover it up. He doesn't want his mom to know he's drawn on the wall. So this starts a big cover up where he... um, pulls together lots of toys and stacks them up and goes to great lengths and gets more and more anxious and upset as he tries to cover up this naughty thing that he's done. Well, um, as you might expect, his mother recognizes there's something a bit fishy about a tall tower of toys <laughs> in front of this um, this wall. And um, she finds out his sin and he, he kind of does what Adam and Eve did, which is they hid from God when they sinned. And he, Arlo hides from his mother, but she finds him and, um, you know, confronts him about the fact that he's drawn on the wall. And much to his surprise, he actually feels great relief when his mother finds out his sin. And they reconcile, she forgives him, he still gets punished. But um, he realizes that covering up his sin Covering up this naughty thing that he did made him really miserable. So, um, so it's a basic story about why we don't want to cover up sin, whether it's from our parents or from God. That um, best not to sin in the first place. But when we do sin, hiding only makes things worse. Um, and the illustrations are done by a woman named Samara Hardy. And I credit your kids wanting to read it over and over again, probably to her illustrations, because they're just really detailed and interesting and the kind of thing that kids love. Yeah, they they are. The illustrations are beautiful, and and I almost would describe them as a bit whimsical. Uh, There's Mm -hmm. lots of bright colors and lots of detail, as you said, and they're just, um, they're really fun. I think one of the other things is I've been thinking about my kids and what it was about the book that has kind of grabbed their attention. I mean, my my one-year-old, he 
he can't even say his R's yet, but he'll ask for Alo. He wants to read Alo, <laughs> and he'll go find it on the bookshelf and and pull it down. But I think I think one of the things that they seem interested in is the fact that it's a story about a boy who does something wrong, that he he does something that they that he knows is wrong, and then he's kind of the whole story, as you said, is him trying to sort of cover it up and hide it, and. I guess I've just been thinking myself, why is it that, that that's so compelling to them and so interesting for them to kind of look at and then see that reconciliation that happens at the end with his mom? Did you think about that? Was there, have you ever noticed that about kids? And Definitely. was that part of the story for you? Yes. If you think about a story where nobody does anything wrong, it's there's just not really a plot there. You know, we can have books and there's lots of great instructional children's books that teach them things. But if you're really thinking about a story, to get a plot, usually something has to either go wrong or someone has to do something wrong. And I think children are fascinated by reading about naughtiness for good and for ill. But I think the, that a lot of our children's books are very, very sanitized in a way that just makes them boring to children. Whereas the Bible's not the least bit sanitized. The Christian faith, the story of salvation, there's tremendous amount of plot to that. There's plenty of people who do things wrong. I know some some parents don't want their children to read about naughty children because they think they're good ideas, but children have no problem coming up with their own ideas yeah. for naughty things to do. <laughs> so I do believe that many of the best children's books and stories include um, children doing something wrong in a way that doesn't enforce or encourage other children to do that. But hopefully like this one shows the outworkings of it and helps the children not want to do that thing that Arlo did, mm. but rather avoid it. Yeah. I was struck by just how simple the story is. It's not complex. There's a very, there's only two characters. I guess there's a cat as well. Who's kind of, always around um, kind of making faces that I think telegraph what the reader should be feeling <laughs> at that exactly. moment. Yes. The cat looks more, more nervous than Arlo does in the beginning. <laughs> um, and as, as the children are also feeling nervous, I think when he starts to draw on the wall. Well, and that's the thing is it, it feels so um, familiar, you know, I, even, even those who aren't parents, I think will have a sense for just, it, it's just such a, a simple little story. And yet, it connects, I think because of that, it connects with kids who have all been there and who've all um, in their own ways kind of willfully disobeyed their parents and then tried to hide it. Uh, it makes me, it made me wonder a little bit about just uh, some of the other, you mentioned other kids books that do this well. Were there any other books that inspired you on this or were kind of like, ah, oh, I'm shooting for something like this. And then how did you sort of try to do it your own way or a little bit differently? Well, there wasn't a book in particular, but I believe that stories, really good stories, have the power to help form our moral imaginations. And by moral imaginations, I mean they help us think about the outworkings of what a particular behavior would be. So, I mean, a classic example is Peter Rabbit. The mother rabbit tells him not to go in Mr. McGregor's garden. He does it. He's really sorry. And, um, you know, he realizes his mother knew what she was doing all along. So n having these examples, these negative examples like Arlo or Peter Rabbit, they're not going to necessarily keep a child from doing something wrong, but it, it does give them the chance to think through, wow, if I did this, maybe it wouldn't turn out well, or I, now I have done this, maybe covering it up from my mom is not going to turn out well. And it, it just helps them learn from others' mistakes in a way that they don't have to repeat it themselves. They may still repeat it. You know, we're all sinful. Um, children are sinners. You know, there's, it's, it's certainly not going to be foolproof in helping them always make the right choices. But many, many great classic children's stories include um, behavior that, that helps children not repeat it. Mm. I'm struck that as, as adults, we can often, I know I've, I've felt this before when it comes to reading literature or even reading the Bible, there can be the sense of just tell me what the right thing is. Tell me what to do. Give me the straight 
kind of didactic teaching for what the principle is. And we kind of lose patience with the with the the value of a story illustrating maybe a principle or an idea, uh, and yet the stories can, as you said, be so powerful for imparting those truth, uh, those principles, and those values. Um, do you think part of the 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 loss of some of this uh, among parents is that we kind of we think we move beyond the need for stories like this? Yes. Well, I think that I think that it feels more efficient to impart information through just teaching your children. And I think sometimes parents might be afraid that a story isn't going to get the message across clearly enough. And I think we need both. We need to instruct our children. We need to help them learn Bible verses, catechize them. But that um, that alone isn't enough. I think we also need to engage their imaginations and their hearts uh, to take things a step further. So um, stories can help us feel the way we ought to feel about God's commands. For example, um, you know, you could t- say you have a teenager, say we're thinking a little bit older, and you explain to a teenager why it's good to live within your means and not go into debt. You can draw figures on a piece of paper and they can cognitively understand it. But then later, if they read a book like Great Expectations and they see someone make choices that lead them into debt and the kind of anguish and helplessness that comes with that, all of a sudden they're going to feel the way they ought to feel about it. So I think that you need the teaching, you need the straight teaching of what are God's commands, what is right and wrong, what is the law of our country. But it's also good to bring a story element in to help engage the emotions so that we feel the way we ought to feel about these things. Hmm. So that's that's the big, big value of a story is that it helps to uh, make us feel the right way about something, not just intellectually know the right answer. I think I think that's primarily it. Yes. Um, And it it just uh, sometimes it stays with us longer. You know, um, if you like, like your children, I'm sure they could tell you the whole, the whole story of Arlo and the great big cover up, you know, because it, it's a plot and it's lodged in their imagination, um, in a way that if you just told them before bed, if you do something wrong, don't hide it from mommy and daddy. Well, they may or may not remember that, you know, it just is a, is a stories can be an aid to really getting something deep in our hearts. Yeah, I'm struck by uh, the last few years, it seems like there's just been this wonderful resurgence of uh, children's books uh, from a Christian worldview and perspective. And many of those books have focused on you know, retelling the Bible stories, um, uh, even retelling kind of the broader gospel narrative of Scripture, the history of redemption. And, and they've been such a treasure and a valuable thing for so many parents uh, with kids, you know, young kids all the way up to, to older children. And yet it seems like there's not as many uh, explicit, explicitly Christian books aimed at kids focused on this idea of moral formation. Uh, I wonder, have you noticed that and why do you think that might be? Yes, I think you're exactly right. And I love the books that teach the big story of scripture and theology. Um, and I'm thrilled with those. I think the reason that Christians, particularly Reformed evangelical Christians who have a high value for the gospel, I think they can be afraid that if they try to do moral formation, they will be um, guilty of moralism. But I really think moral formation and moralism are two very different things. So moral formation is teaching at its most basic, it's teaching the difference between right and wrong. And Christian moral formation is teaching right from wrong according to the Bible and God's commands. Moralism, on the other hand, is a kind of self-salvation where you believe that if you do the right things, God will love you and reward you, and that ultimately you can save yourself by doing the right things. We don't always put it that explicitly, but sometimes we we teach that through the through what we model and through the way we live our lives. So I think that people worry that if you have a book about why a child should tell the truth, they may then walk away from that and think, oh, if I tell the truth, that will save me. If, if I do everything right, that will save me. 
I don't think that's actually the case. I think that stories that aid in moral formation and moral formation in general um, is, is a really important part of parenting. And unless children are formed morally and know the difference between right and wrong, they won't understand what sin is and they won't understand their need for the gospel. So moral formation has kind of a, um, a formative role uh, before a child really understands the gospel, that first they have to understand what sin is and how it separates them from God, and that really they can't keep God's law and they can't do it all right. Um, so that that's an important part of moral formation. And then once there has been, uh, once the child has accepted the gospel and really believes it, moral formation still has a role because God's commands are good. And all through the scripture, the Old and New Testament, we're told that um, God's children delight to keep his commands. It, he's our creator. He made us. And um, it's a treasure to have the moral law of God to be able to attempt to keep it. And when we don't keep it, to then come to him, confess, repent, and be reconciled to him. So I think it's it's very important that in um, running from moralism and recognizing that we can't save ourselves, our children can't save themselves by their good behavior, they still need to be taught the difference between right and wrong. And if you go to a, a bookstore, a secular bookstore, and look through the children's section, there are so many engaging stories that are doing moral formation from a very secular worldview. And um, they are teaching children things. You might they, they might not be teaching them to tell the truth. They might be tell, teaching children to live their own truth, whatever that is, to be true to themselves. There's all these messages about what is right and wrong is deep inside you. And um, I think Christian parents, Christian teachers, pastors, will really miss out if we're not also doing moral formation through the stories that we read our children. Hmm. Yeah, it's so interesting. What are some of those other, would you say, secular messages that uh, our children are being fed all the time, whether it's through books or through movies or TV shows or games? Do any other messages beyond kind of the look inside yourself, that's where you're going to find strength come to mind? Well, it, it's interesting how many books... Um, picture books written for young children are there to form their minds in the way they think about sexuality without ever mentioning sex or gender. One um, I found was called Red, a Crayon Story, and it's about a crayon that has a red paper on it. And all the other crayons, its teachers, the parents, they all want it to color red, but it only ever colors blue. And finally, in the end, it turns out that it had the wrong paper on. And really, it was a blue crayon all along. I may have this backwards. It may, it may have been a red crayon that had a blue paper. But basically, it's, it's not very subtle if you recognize this is, this is teaching about a child being born into the wrong body and everyone wanting to, to act like a girl when it really feels like a boy deep down on the inside. So you have this kind of just really heavy handed moral message, but it slipped into a pretty delightful story about this crayon that can't color the color everybody wants it to. So um, those are the kinds of moral messages being taught to, to children every day. And I'm sure most parents have had the experience of bringing home a book from the library and having no idea until you get halfway through that this is teaching your children something very different from a scriptural worldview. Mm. Well, I'm, I'm struck by how, uh, in some ways, um, strategic it is to to reach children with some of these messages. It's it's uh, an insight that it seems like a lot of times uh, secular people can understand, and that's why they create these TV shows and books that, that will do this stuff. Do you think there is something, there's something unique about uh, children and using these young ages as a, as a chance to um, yeah, teach them and lay this foundational moral gr uh, uh, groundwork for them for the rest of their lives? I do. I do. I think, um, you know, youth is when you, you are going to be morally formed. And um, I think stories are a big part of that. If um, things can sometimes go, go deeper through a story, uh, for I, I'm just thinking about, you know, the wonderful Chronicles of Narnia. Those are such a great example of 
um, a, a series that has an allegory. You know, there's Christian messages all through it, although someone can read it and not even know those are there. And there's many people who've been read, who've, who've read those as children or had them read aloud that later as adults, they come back read and read it and realize, wow, these are some really sophisticated philosophical arguments that C.S. Lewis is making. And I didn't even know it, but reading the Chronicles of Narnia as a child primed me later on to understand and accept these things and to see how God, God's truth makes sense of the world. So I think um, reading great books and stories early on can help children, teenagers, young adults in college la- later on resonate with the truth. Um, when they encounter it and also recognize lies as well, hopefully. Mm. Yeah. 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 There are a number of themes uh, that you, I think, hit on in the book in this, this pretty subtle way. But as I was reading it again uh, recently, I was just struck by there's so many of these, these moral themes, uh, moral principles even that are there that I think kids will start to get. So I wonder if we could walk through a couple of those. The first was just that there's there seemed to be this idea that you're getting at that um, the fear of getting caught from our sin can actually propel us further into more sin in an effort to hide that. Um, what were you thinking about uh, that idea when you were writing the book? Well, I think that is just something that all humans have in common. That when we do, I mean, like I referenced Adam and Eve earlier, they hid from God in the garden that somehow, you know, I mean, little children, even they think if they put their hand in front of their eyes that you can't see them, you know? Um, but we serve an omniscient God. Um, he sees all of our sin. And I think, I think that impulse to hide our sin and to cover up what we've done wrong is part of our, our, desire to save ourselves, that we think, oh, maybe if God doesn't know I've done this, or maybe if my parents don't know I've done this, it'll be as if I haven't done it. But really, the only help for us, for children to get out of the huge mess that we've made of the world and of our lives is to have outside help from God. We need a savior. So really, it's only when we recognize and admit what we've done wrong that we can start to, um, you know, make things right, that God can make things right for us. Mm. Yeah, I think probably my favorite part is of the story is when he, he has written on his wall and then he piles up all of his toys on his bed, making this mountain of toys in an effort to cover it up. And then his mom comes in and he's hiding under the bed. And it's just such an obvious kind of comical scene where he's thinking maybe he can hide. And it's interesting, though, because as I'm reading this with my kids and and I'm kind of asking them along the way, you know, you know, what's Arlo doing? Oh, he's hiding. And do you think his mom knows what's going on, knows where he is? And the kids are able, because it's a story, I think they're able to see the true picture there and see through that. Um, but I was struck by just, as I read that, kind of like what you were getting at, recognizing how I do that with God as well. And sometimes these kinds of stories can kind of help us to even reflect back on ourselves a little bit differently. It, it's true because just as it's ridiculous for a little boy to think his mom doesn't know he's under the bed, it's crazy for us to think that we can run from God or that we can somehow clean ourselves up enough that God won't see our sin. But we all do it. And it's just, it's wonderful to step back and to, you know, to be able to laugh with this little boy at him hiding from his mom and at the same time laugh at ourselves that we would ever try to hide from God because it's, it's just impossible. Um, but thank God it's impossible. Mm. Well, and that's, that's one of the things that I also love about the book and that I think sets it apart from, uh, it helps to guard against the moralism that, that fear of moralism that you were talking about earlier. And it's that there is this confession and then there's the relief of forgiveness that comes at the end. And there's a restoration there that is really, really moving and beautiful uh, what were you trying to, what were the, some of the, the important truths you were trying to capture there at the end? Well, I think um, there there's the problem of Arlo now has a big 
muddy looking mess on his wall because when he tries to clean it up himself, it just gets worse looking and he needs his mother to help him get it off the wall. But even more important than that is for him to be reconciled and forgiven by his mother. So um, even as he is going to, he does get consequences. He has his screen time taken away um, for a couple of days. You know, I I wanted um, there to be this sense of there are consequences for our sin, but even those consequences, when he's wrapped in his mother's embrace, he recognizes it's, it's so much better than if she didn't know his sin. And I think um, with us, uh, you know, I want people to feel that same hunger to be back in right fellowship with God. You know, our uh, we are, we are when God looks at us, He sees Christ's righteousness. But when we are actively sinning and turning back from God's law, even as believers, there's there's a broken fellowship. And when we confess our sin and repent of it and accept God's forgiveness. There's such a wonderful sense of being embraced by him. So I, I wanted parents and children both to see that. So one of the other themes that the book addresses is just the idea of discipline. And, you know, as you mentioned before, uh, the mom takes away the, the Arlo screen time for a couple of days. And I wonder, what are your thoughts on, I think one of the, the most challenging things parents can wrestle with is how do I balance uh, appropriately disciplining my kids, uh, having consequences for their their disobedience, and yet also modeling and showing them grace and, and showing them what it looks like to have punishment taken away. Uh, and so how do you, what advice would you offer to parents along those lines? How do you bring those two things together? Yeah, I think, you know, we see the Bible talk about God, God's discipline for his children and that a parent who loves their child will discipline them. Um, the same way that God disciplines his children. And if you look at families where there is a lack of discipline, there's, there are not consequences for doing wrong, you tend to have a lot of yelling in those families, a lot of uh, f- uh, friction between the parents and the children because the children aren't doing what they're supposed to be doing. And that just kind of goes on and on. Whereas I think when parents are wise in how they discipline and there are um, swift and fair consequences when children disobey, it helps with that reconciliation process. Both the parent and the child understands this um, wrong has been dealt with. Uh, you know, this this child has been given consequences and now we can move on. Rather than, I just want to punish the child by being angry with them for a while and Maybe I'll, maybe mom will forget about it and then things will go back to normal. That to me is the worst case scenario because there's, there's just not a clear path to reconciliation. Now that is very different from the way that we are saved um, through Christ because he is the one that took the penalty. So I think that um, there are ways to talk about it with your children that you can help them understand you're disciplining them and giving them a consequence or a punishment because you love them. And this will help them learn not to do this again. Well, at the same time, um, that is not the way that salvation works, that we, that Christ paid our penalty. He took our consequence for us. Um, so it, it is, it's a different situation, but I think, um, discipline and consequences help children learn about um, that when you do something wrong, there is a price that then has to be paid. And um, for these, for in most cases, children pay that consequence through some sort of punishment. But in the case of salvation, which is much you know bigger, we could never, uh, you know, we, we could never even pay for what we've done wrong. Christ did that for us. Mm, yeah, yeah. So what, what encouragement would you offer to maybe the parent listening right now who uh, has young children? This is the kind of book that they might read with their children, and they're just feeling maybe a little bit overwhelmed. Maybe they're dealing with a, a strong-willed child who uh, doesn't listen well, is disobedient, and maybe they haven't done a great job uh, teaching their children, diso- uh, <laughs> disciplining their children consistently in, in the right ways, and they just feel kind of discouraged and maybe unsure how to move forward. What word of encouragement would you offer to that person? Well, I think one thing that can kind of overwhelm parents sometimes is feeling like 
they have to include the whole gospel in every teaching moment and every conversation. And I would, I would try to narrow things down a little bit and make it a little bit more manageable that sometimes you might just be teaching your child the difference between right and wrong. And that will then come into play later on when you have conversations about sin and forgiveness and the gospel. But I think parents um, can maybe scale down their expectations. This may be counter to what some other people would say, but God has given you, uh, you know, when they're very young, you're teaching them not to put their hands in the electric socket. Um, That is just something you need to teach your children not to do for their own safety. Later on, there's moral lessons that they just need to learn um, for the ability to function in the world. And then as they grow, um, God will give you opportunities to talk about the gospel, salvation, why we can't live up to his plan. But I think sometimes that fear of moralism, that fear of um, thinking Parents don't want their children to think they only care about whether their children does right or wrong, or they only love them if they do right. I think um, just recognize the God-given task that God gives parents to train up a child in the way that he or she should go, and then to um, also train them up in the gospel alongside that, but not to feel like every single instance of discipline is a time where where you need to get the whole story of salvation into that one incident. Mm. Yeah, I can I can see that. I, I felt the pressure at times whenever uh, any child does anything wrong and there needs to be any kind of correction. There's just maybe a latent guilt of, oh, I wasn't able to sit down face to face for five minutes and talk through the whole gospel with them and kind of explain it in that context. I think sometimes we can think the discipline has to always happen that way. But you're kind of saying we maybe can let go a little bit of that at times depending on the situation. I think so, especially if that's going to keep you from disciplining them. Like, so I would hope that you would establish good patterns of when, you know, when a child is disobedient, swift correction, and hopefully there will be an ongoing conversation of why you're disciplining them, what they did wrong, you know, but I I think if, um, if you make it such a big deal that you have to have this long protracted episode, you're probably going to be less likely to actually administer the discipline. And then the child won't learn to be obedient in the way that they should. So I would, I would say consistency is the first thing to shoot for. And then as you establish that consistency, hopefully you won't have to discipline as often and can have more times for those big conversations Mm -hmm. about grace and forgiveness. Well, it's good to remember too that you know parenting is a is a many year type of endeavor, and that there's many opportunities for conversations. It's not like any one conversation is going to make or break uh, your your you know efforts to form your child. Exactly, exactly. Well, Betsy, thank you so much for taking some time to talk today and uh, to to help us think a little bit more maybe intentionally about what it means to teach our children the difference between right, right and wrong and, and to ultimately teach them to turn to Christ and uh, to, to seek full forgiveness and cleansing from Him and not uh, from themselves. Thank you, Matt. It's been a pleasure to talk to you. That was Betsy Childs Howard on the importance of moral formation for children. For more, be sure to check out her book with Crossway, Arlo and the Great Big Cover-Up available online or at your local Christian bookstore. For more interviews like this, subscribe to the Crossway Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast player. If you enjoyed this episode, leave us a review, which helps us spread the word about the show. Crossway is a not-for-profit Christian ministry that exists solely for the purpose of proclaiming the truth of God's word through publishing gospel-centered content. Visit us today at crossway.org.